got a long, long, long way to go yet. Yeah. Um, and the likes of Marquez can still make a comeback. Mm. <laughs> Can't wait. Uh, <laughs> it's a long, long way to go, isn't it? But uh, I, I want to move on, if I may, to um, I just want to sort of see off our top three and, and talk about Ducati as well, because you mentioned it earlier, Pete. You know, I think they say it on the commentary as well. Jorge Martin is a, a pit bull when he com- comes to these. He put up a stonking defence and then just didn't quite have it uh, eventually against the Spargro. Um, but that's his first point of the year, isn't it, for Martin? And the highest Ducati, I think Bagnaia was the next as well. So... What did you make of Martin's performance? We know he's fast anyway, and to get that second place, he seemed elated when he crossed the line as well. I mean, as you're saying, he's been fast in qualifying in all these rounds. It's just that he hasn't put it together in the race. And obviously, he got taken out by Bagnaia in round one, not his fault. He fell in the wet in Mandalika again. One of those things, he didn't have a lot of experience. It looked like he hit a bit of a stream across the track, didn't it? So, you know, he's been saying, look, because people have you know, been in his video calls and everything else. And people have been saying, you know, you're feeling a bit of pressure and things like that. And he said, well, look, you know, I've been fast. It's just that it hasn't all come together yet, but but I'm sure it will. And this is where he sort of put it together. And this is, you know, he can build from this. I mean, he's, this is the first dry podium for the GP22. I mean, he can show that on a, on a weekend where, let's say the favoured guys, the factory riders had much bigger problems with the setup and trying to make that bike work. You know, we saw Jack Miller, Never got a setup that worked in the end. Banyaya did get one, but it was too late, wasn't it? He'd already, he couldn't, I mean, it was a great ride. He had the pace of the podium, but starting so far back, he couldn't, uh, you know, he couldn't get those podium points. But Martin was there in qualifying and he was there in the race. He was the guy that, that got that consistency in. His teammate Zarko obviously fell off. He didn't finish. Um, Luca Barini went the opposite way. He was starting next to Martin and, and he faded back. He was another guy who had these, these sort of big rear grip problems. So he's the consistent guy, really, as far as Ducati are concerned this weekend. And it's going to be really interesting. Can he continue this? Because we know that, you know, once he gets that confidence, we saw when he won the race last year and, and then when he came back from the injury and he, you know, won again and the end of the year was really strong for him. And he's got the chance now to really prove to Ducati that, also, as we're saying for next year, for the contracts for next year and say, look, I'm the guy you, that, that can, you know, lead your project potentially. I want a factory ride. I think he's been pretty clear about that. Bastianini, as we know, also wants one. Um, Bastianini, of course, came into the race leading the world championship, but uh, wasn't able on the GP21, of course, last year's bike. Potentially that could have been, with all the changing conditions, having last year's bike could have could have worked out for him. It didn't, but there we are. Those two guys, you know, they're two great young riders that Ducati have got. The, it's momentum started with Bastianini. It's now sw- swung across to Martin. It's going to be great to see this sort of battle between them as the season goes on. What confuses me hugely that where there should be an advantage for uh, eight bikes on the grid belonging to Ducati, and yet they were in all at sea over setup throughout all of those eight bikes. And it was a Pramac Ducati. I know it's a still a factory Ducati, but it was a Pramac Ducati that got it sorted out the best. Um, I find it slightly difficult to understand why the factory boys are having so much trouble. Jack Miller's not happy. There's no doubt about it. Bang Naya was incandescent. You know, there's something very strange going on there from testing, which looked like it was going to be a Ducati whitewash this year to where we are now after three Grand Prix. It's stunning, a stunning failure by Ducati at the moment. You know, it's, it looked like it was going to be their season. And still, we look back to Casey Stoner for Ducati um, deliverance. It seems very, very odd to me. I don't understand where it's gone wrong. What decision they made when they had to take that cutoff point in Qatar, where the technical regs say, this is what you now, you know, once, once you've reached that point in Qatar, the first round, this is the bike you run for the rest of the year, because they don't have any concessions like Aprilia, obviously. Um, It's a bit of a disaster. I, I, Todd has said in a question on this, just it might might add to the situation. He says, do you feel like Ducati have actually out-teched themselves at oh. the factory level? <laughs> well, well you've, got, you've got to, I mean, like you can never out-tech yourself, I don't think, when it comes to prototype stuff, because it's, it's they're a well-thought-out, well-funded, well-backed, you know, team. It's a, it's it's going to be a combination of things that that, they seem to get themselves down an alley at the moment with this. I mean, it's, I don't understand it, Pete. I mean, I, mean, I genuinely, I'd, I'd, I'd like to be able to say something intelligent on this and I can't. I know a lot of people will say, well, that's part of the course, but 
it's one of those situations where I can't work out why Ducati are in the state that they're in, you know, and and they either rely on the old bike as they did previously, and now you know Pramac have put together. I know Pramac is a fantastic team, but it is still the independent team compared with the factory red team. Um, and you wouldn't normally see that. You wouldn't normally get that. Now and again, perhaps, but it seems strange to me, and I don't understand it. The one sort of theory that I've heard that, that sort of makes logical sense is that partly because of the lack of testing, it seems like with this this new bike, there's quite a narrow operating window of whether you get it right or wrong. And, uh, you know, so you're, what you're seeing is that some guys get it right. And we've seen this at, at certain races this year. And bang, the bike is yeah. know, performing fantastically and able to fight. I understand that. And if they... I understand that, Pete. But the, the problem is, is that, that it's integrated. All their teams are integrated. They're all part of the factory, really. Now, you know, if you've got one bike that's working pretty well, that because you've got eight bikes out on the grid, normally that data is shared around and you can see where the advantages are. Yeah, there was a lack of time maybe in Termas to, to be able to interpret that properly. But they just seem to be so far away from it. I mean, those Ducatis, I've not seen those Ducatis handle like that ever. You know, the, the thing that Bagnaia was on was just, it looked like one of them bikes you got out of the box and no one had tightened the bolts up. <laughs> there seemed to be a different approach to the bumps. As you're saying, they're obviously having big trouble with the with the bumps. Now, in the case of Martin, I think he basically said, you've just got to sort of deal with it. You, you've got to not change the setup too much and just try and, and, and deal with it as a rider. On the other hand, you had, you had Banyaya who said for warm up, he went to a setting that he used at Kota last year to deal with the bumps. Kota was obviously very bumpy last year. We don't know this year with the resurfacing. And that's kind of what put him back in contention. But then as you say, Keith, you had Jack Miller and they were never able to find a setup that worked for him. And that was the confusing thing. You also have Marini struggle for rear grip. Jack Miller had no front confidence. It, so there's a, there's a, all these different things going on. Um, and I, I mean, Banyaya said it'd be great to have more winter testing, wouldn't it? But that's not the way it is now with all these races. You know, you get a couple of couple of tests. We know they've got different engines. Is that a factor? Is this, you know, we know that the, the factory team has this sort of hybrid mix of engines. The, the satellite guys have just the, let's say, the standard GP22, don't we? What difference is that making? Who knows? I mean... The, the, are they are these little combinations and differences is that what's what's causing the, the issue here really difficult as you say keith to, to put your finger on it because they were so strong at the end of last year we've seen all this talk about the front ride height device as well has that you know has the bike been sort of designed with that as an integral part and now we seem to see that that is maybe not being used because it's not it's proving harder to set up than they might have thought it would Harry, it's it's really difficult to know Harry, in answer to your question, Todd, you're right. They have, they have outtaked him. No, yeah, well, that that comes down to it, doesn't it? No one really knows that the, 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 there is no answer, and that's why Ducati are probably so frustrated and their riders because there is they can't understand it on paper. We were all saying coming into this season, you know, it, we were a bit worried that actually would they dominate, you know, and and that is certainly not the case. But just to sort of, we could I think we could talk about Ducati for for a fair while, but. I want to just uh, pick up on uh, Marco Bezecchi, uh, the rookie, highest rookie, and he got his best results, uh, which I think went a little bit under the radar, quite naturally, really. But uh, P9 for uh, Bezecchi and a few points scooped up. So uh, a nice run from the Italian in the uh, the VR46, Keith. Yeah, I think VR46, I mean, as a team, <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Because it was the weekend that, that uh, Valentino was racing as well in the cars as well, uh, away. So you know, VR46 were busy this weekend, but to have a front row start with his brother, of course, you know, Luca Marini on the front row, that was a great situation. Okay, he slid a little bit back. Bezecchi looking good as well. You know, things are happening in that team. It's it's a nice start to the season for me. And once they start putting it together consistently, Bezecchi's a great little rider. It's a it's a funny thing when you transit up to up to the top class, you know, you you can never be really sure how you're going to go. You know, testing is one thing, nice clean lines, you know, you've got no one else around you and all the rest of it. And all of a sudden, you know, you're doing 210 mile an hour at Termas. It's a fast racetrack. It's got some very quick corners. Pete's already said it's got a few bumps here and there that one or two were a little bit more emphasized this year. Bear in mind, we haven't been there since 2019. You know, track's usually dirty. We're all a day late. You know, it could not get harder than it got in Termas de Rio Ando because, you know, 
track time is everything. You've got to have track time. Track cleans up. I mean, I'm amazed that he cleaned up as quick as he did, as well as it did. But you go offline, and all you got was a rooster tail of of dust and sand in the air. You know, it's and it warmed up. I think you you alluded to it a little earlier, Pete. I mean, it went. You know, the track was was right up there, temperature wise, above forty odd degrees. I think we were nearly fifty degrees by the time of track temperature. It went up from something like thirty for the Moto threes through the Moto twos to the to the Moto GP bikes. Now that's the warmest it had been all weekend. That throws all your settings out again. You know, you end up, if you're following people and your front tyre gets a bit more heat in it because you've not got enough wind around it, you know, you end up with that slight ballooning of, of the tyre, so you lose grip. Um, you know, interesting combination of tyres. They needed the hard compound in, in, as a front tyre and yet a soft compound as a rear tyre. So you've got the support in the braking areas that you needed because you were leaning on that front tyre as much as you were everywhere. So there were a lot of small technical details you needed to get right without the time to get it right quite often. So you can kind of understand where, again, get back to Todd's question, where you could out-tech yourself. You know, it's it's it, it, only so much you can get through in the small amount of time that you've got to get through it. But if you'd, have, you know, <laughs> most riders, if, if, you're, if you're up against it, you sort of, you, you know, it's no good trying to protect your homework. You know, someone's going to look over and see see what you, you know, they've got access to all the other um, screens of the of the, the, the Ducati, for instance, camp. You can read other people's data. That will have been there to share. But how you interpret that is really difficult. And again, it's all very well interpreting it, putting it on your bike, then going out and testing it and saying, well, that's a load of crap. And I can't make that work. And then you've run out of another session. And um, that 40 minute walk, they doubled the warm up on Sunday morning. And they bloody needed to as well. Instead of 20 minutes, it was 40 minutes. Because most of those guys would have been chucking settings at it for the warm-up. But, of course, the warm-up is actually in much cooler conditions than it turned out to be for the race. So they were in really a no-win situation. Anyone who had a great base setting that worked when they arrived, when they got it out of the box eventually on Friday night, very late on Friday night, think of the techs. They were working like crazy on, on Friday night, all night, most of them. Um, if they got it out of the box with a decent setting and the rider rode out there and didn't complain too much in his first session, you were likely to be the man that was at the front end of the field. And, and probably worth adding that of all the teams that were affected by these freight delays, it was VR46, one of the worst affected, weren't they? I think VR46 and Grassini had nothing, apparently, literally nothing. No helmets, wow. no leathers, let alone bikes and pit garages. So... For them to go from a situation where they stood in, you can see the pictures on on Crash from from the Golden Goose guys, stood in an empty pit box on Friday, with with just a bare concrete floor and absolutely zero equipment, to to actually having Marini on the front row on Saturday and then Bezecchi riding from I think he was twentieth on the opening lap. He fought all the way back through the night. So Bezecchi's looking, you know, he's looking pretty impressive. And someone, anyone that catches the eye, Casey Stoner and Casey Stoner. When he was in the paddock last year, was saying that he'd seen some things in Bezeki. Some of the lines he was using in Moto Two a bit different to the others. If you catch Casey Stoner's eye, then you know there's there's good reason for it. So, yeah, Bezeki's Bezeki's starting to impress. It was he wasn't just fast in the race, was he? There was a few sessions this weekend where he popped in, I think, into the top five. Um, you know, now the talent's there. So yeah, one to watch definitely. Glad you mentioned Golden Goose there. I mean, uh, David Goldman, who is a, is an old veteran cameraman difficult geezer if you get on the wrong side of him and uh, gareth harford is his um cohort as well in that particular company but didn't we do well this weekend when it came to coverage difficult weekend of course for the racers but how about the cameraman that also hadn't warmed up did they miss anything i didn't see if they didn't that some stunning shots through turns 13 and 14 that final the amount of incidents at that and Dorna camera guys got it all. Absolutely every single tiny nuance in super slow mo. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever seen. We have seen it good with Dorna, but this time round, I mean, them camera guys, they deserve the first award of the weekend for getting the kind of action that they got. Brilliant stuff. And they don't. They hadn't had any practice with fast motorbikes on the on the Friday like they would do normally either. So they, they were they were starting from a cold start as well. I think we should do that every week, actually. Keith's Award of the Weekend, and uh, who deserves it each week? And this week goes clearly to the Dorner and all the photographers uh, and the cameramen around the track. It was a, a remarkable uh, 
just a remarkable weekend, really. I've not quite seen anything like that in sort of any kind of motorsport, especially with, with all of the freight. Um, well, actually, Harry, we could also, as well as the, the only reason they can all get it as well as they do is because hmm. uh, Jano Cefeli of Dromo, who designed the track and revamped the track, but you know, we've only been up here nine years, I think, haven't we, for, at, at Termas de Rio Hondo. The track is brilliant. It's in the middle of bloody nowhere. I mean, it's the most difficult track to get out, out of all of them. And and, and it, it is a brilliant racetrack. It gives you brilliant racing. And it, and the riders love it. You know, it's, it's kind of one of them ones. <clears throat> so it's another one of me ranting on about everyone's got to make their way. Have, have I ever found a Grand Prix track that I don't like yet? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Le Mans. Pro- Maybe Le Mans. Surely. <laughs> well, hang on. To... We, uh, the rants are great, but we are pushed for time. And I want to just see off before we talk about Moto2 and Moto3 briefly. I want to just touch on Suzuki. I think it's worth doing that. Best result of the season for them. Third and fourth. Rins gets his podium. Keith, you called it, although you're a bit bit optimistic. He wasn't second. He was third. Um, but great run from Suzuki. And actually, while Aspargo and, and Martin were fighting up front, Rins was reeling them in and, and was, you know, looking to be in the fight if Spargo wasn't able to get past him. So uh, I think they seemed both encouraged after the race. Suzuki have finally sort of, after the first couple of rounds, got the result that they should have already had, really, I think. Yeah, Alex Rins has got form here. He obviously likes it around this racetrack. And that, that when you're on a difficult weekend, that's always a bit handy if you've got some good muscle memory regarding a racetrack. So Rins was, was for me, you know, the Suzuki's looking good. You know, again, it's a, it's a great little motorbike. It's a bit in the Yamaha camp, really, isn't it? It's a great motorbike. Out of all of them, you know, if you jumped on one, you'd probably like to ride the Yamaha and ride the Suzuki as a, as a punter. You know, the Ducati, I think, with all the buttons and push buttons and bits and bobs and all the rest of it, it's a bit like driving a spaceship, so that might be slightly more difficult. Um, but it's a great bike, and I think that it wasn't too difficult to predict that Rins might be there or thereabouts, and he was. He looked good last time out as well. He's, he's riding well, Rins, so maybe his time is coming. Um but it comes back to that concessions thing that I mentioned before, didn't it? When they had concessions, the bike was coming on really, really well. And then when they lost their concessions, they were all at sea for a little while. But uh, this year, they've made a step. It's fast. Um, and it's going to need to be. Teammate Mia, of course, was also, well, he was fourth, wasn't he? I think so. He was he was pretty close, but he was saying he got back to that feeling that he had in previous years where he's strong at the end of the race. So he was actually feeling pretty happy as well. And uh, he was another guy who was saying a bit like he said earlier that really, you know, it's a case of don't panic in these opening rounds. It's a long season for him. The season really gets going once once the championship moves to Europe. So he he was very satisfied. He's he's not been on the podium yet. I say nine riders on the podium, and you haven't got guys like Mia. You know who'd have thought that? But um, yeah, he was very happy because we saw in Qatar, didn't we? That he didn't have that end of end of race sort of push that he's had in the past, and that the Suzuki's been famous for. And he was sort of quite perplexed by it wasn't he well he felt he got back to that so it's you know is it a one-off we'll have to see this weekend in Kota but yeah he was certainly a a much happier guy after the race he was uh, not far off the podium either you have a habit Pete of throwing these things out there you just said nine riders on the podium I mean you need to bloody elaborate on that because it's outstanding isn't it it's nine different riders have been on the podium in the first three rounds you know like I'm not going to steal your thunder but I will underline what you just said there that is a massive thing could this be? And one for of me, the it's it's the, it's the guys GP that are not. Well, yeah, potentially. I'm, I was just going to say, for me, it's the guys that are not in that nine that is almost the biggest shock. I mean, it's nine different riders without Juan Mir, without Francesco Bagnaia, the, the title runner up, without Mark Marquez, obviously, but there's good reason for that, uh, without Jack Miller. I mean, so it's nine riders, even without multiple race winners being included amongst them. It's, it's yeah, really, well, we obviously didn't predict it, but I don't think many people would have. No, we'll have to comb back through uh, the the comments and see who did get it right. Um, okay, let's park MotoGP there for the minute and uh, have a look at Moto2 and Moto3. Moto2 first, the second winner. 